Probably one of the most polarizing audio brands out there, Klipsch has certainly made a name for itself over the past many decades as an American brand that's all about bringing high value, high output, and a lot of fun when listening to music. So today we are taking a look at the Klipsch R41M bookshelf loudspeaker. And is this speaker Rocky Road or is it Hi, I'm Matt, this is the Ohm Audio Channel, and today we are talking about the Klipsch R41M bookshelf loudspeaker. Coming in at an MSRP of $280, uh, this loudspeaker is really kind of the entry point into the Klipsch family, other than their headphones, portable speakers, or even multimedia speakers. Now, I say $280 because that is what is listed on the Klipsch website, um, but in reality, you're going to be paying somewhere around the $180, and this thing goes on sale regularly for about $90 from various retailers such as Amazon or even, in my case, Costco. So what are you getting for your $180 to $90? Well, for starters, you do get a magnetic grill. So thank you, Clips. And underneath that magnetic grill is a 1-inch aluminum tweeter, which is set in their patented Tractrix 90-degree horn. Um, this horn is designed to control directivity as well as provide some horn loading efficiency to the tweeter. Below that you are met with a 4 inch injection molded graphite woofer. Um, you can be forgiven for thinking it's actually a polymer plastic woofer but it is indeed a different material than just a, a bog standard type of plastic woofer. Um, the vinyl wrap that they include for this speaker is actually one of the nicer vinyl wraps I've seen at a, a lower price point. Um, it is The wood grain on it is actually very convincing. The embossing that process that they use on this vinyl wrap is, does give it a, a definite texture to it that gives it a, a fairly convincing wood grain uh, look to it. On the back, you are met with a key slot mounting, which honestly, I don't know why you would want to because this speaker is rear ported. Um, and the report on this is fairly significant in size compared to some other speakers that use a 4-inch driver, namely the Dayton Audio MK402X. Um, and then below that, you have the standard 5-way gold-plated binding post set into a plastic cup. And then Clips rates the speaker for a 50-watt continuous 200-watt peak power rating. Um, it is rated for 8 ohms. And it has a reported frequency response of 68 hertz to 21 kilohertz, which we will get into that when we take a look at the measurements in this review. Um, now that's to take a look at the features. Let's talk about our listening impressions. I can't hear you. It's too dark in here. For my listening impressions, I was streaming Amazon Music HD, and I will include my listening playlist in the description below if in case you're interested in that. Um, for the equipment I used, I used both my Yamaha TSR700, which is the Costco version of their RX V6A, as well as my Adcom GFA5500, which was fed through a shit bifrost multi-bit uh, DAC and into a Pass Labs clone. Uh, preamp. My listening distances varied anywhere from uh, 10 feet to a near field here on my desktop. I now used equalization in a few uh, instances just to kind of confirm my suspicions on the voicing of the speaker. Now let's talk about bass. Um, and the reason why I want to start with bass is because it's simply the easiest thing to talk about in this speaker because, well, there isn't any. <laughs> um, this speaker has a pretty dramatic roll off after about 80 hertz. Now, if you were to press this speaker against the wall, you will get a little bit of a get boundary gain to it, but it kind of comes at a cost of that it's going to also elevate the mid bass region, which tends to get a little bit boomy if too close to a wall. Um, so I would not suggest doing that if you wanted additional bass. If you're looking for more bass, you're just going to have to get a subwoofer and you're going to have to get one that's going to play reasonably well up to about 100 hertz in order to get a good crossover with this speaker. So with the bass out of the way, going into the mid bass and lower mid range region, there is definitely a bump in the response. When listening to things that feature a lot of upright bass or um, toms on the drums, there are certainly notes that just become accentuated because of there's a, some kind of a peak in the response. And it was most noticeable when I was listening to the album Alive in the Wilderness. And a particular track I like to listen on there is Wolfhead, where it is an upright string brace 
just getting sawed away very aggressively. Um, and for the most part, there's a very rich, full sound to it. And while the upright bass had a lot of texture to it and some tonality, you lose a lot of the lower octaves to it for the harmonics, as well as the, the resonance of the body of that upright bass. But then you notice certain notes just come out a little bit more accentuated than others and not necessarily because the player is playing more loudly it's just because there is a bump in the response for the speaker uh, now moving out of the mid bass into the mid-range region um, things are fairly well controlled here uh, singers come through very nicely male singers have nice a little bit of body to them uh, female singers are very clear um, nothing is overly accentuated here so I think the mid-range on the speaker is actually is is nice it's just a little pulled back from the rest of the response in the speaker so if you like a speaker that's a little bit more mid-range forward this may not necessarily be the speaker for you and then moving into the upper mid-range and treble region where we hand off from the woofer to the tweeter things start off pretty good but they'd certainly get away from you in a quick hurry uh, what I mean by that is the the response is almost like it's shelved up from the woofer. It, it's almost like there's a tail of two drivers going on with this speaker where you have the level output of the woofer and then the level output of the tweeter is just drastically different. It's almost like it's mismatched. Now, there are other speakers I've heard that have elevated treble, but the way that they elevate that treble is a little bit more... Um, cohesive in the way that they integrate between the two drivers uh, but in this case there is certainly a shelf there from when you hand off from mid-range into the tweeter and it is a little bit distracting at times uh, when listening to the song Keith Del Go in the live album for the artist that I'm not going to try to pronounce but I'm going to put the thumbnail up here on the screen um, at first it sounds nice because there is a, a nice chorus effect that he puts to the acoustic guitar and it's really nice to listen to it's pleasant it's got some energy to it it's a live sound but as the song progresses further and he gets a little bit more aggressive in the playing things get out of hand and i am honestly like i'm, I'm not really enjoying this as much for me some songs were okay uh, because the way they were in recorded, there's not a lot of upper treble energy there. But in other songs, I just, I can't, I cringe at the level of energy there. Another kind of example of this is when I was listening to the album Jazz in the Pawn Shop, which is another live recording album, um, there is a vibraphone that is used throughout the whole album. And the vibraphone itself sounded nice. There was some decent body to the, the instrument. Um, it came through very smoothly. But the thing you notice is that the mallet hits when every time you would hit one of the bells, that initial tack of the mallet against it would be much more accentuated than I've heard on previous speakers. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it was just a little distracting because it's like, I, I don't really think it's supposed to sound like that. Another example is Livingston Taylor's Isn't She Lovely? At the very beginning of the song, when he says the words, Isn't She Lovely? He says it very quickly, and it's not quite separated the way he says, isn't she lovely? It's, isn't she lovely? But the T and the S sounds just really jump out at you um, as he says those. And again, it's not really bad, but it certainly is distracting. Um, but the rest of that song was just fine. It's just those little nuances from the S's and the T's as he sings them that just, it jumps out and calls attention to this, the, these tweeters. And really, that's just because that's what Klipsch does. They have a certain sound. They have a certain way they like to present the music. They want something that's fun. They want something that's energetic. But for a lot of people, including myself, it's just a little bit too much of a good thing. All right, so that's our tonality listening impressions. Let's talk about soundstage and imaging. Where'd that come from? For soundstage and imaging, um, center image on these things was absolutely rock solid. I was very, very pleased with how these things can present, can present a center image. Um, actually, when I first pulled these things out of the box, plopped them down on the stands about two feet away from the wall, pulled up my first track, and I actually had to double check on my AVR to make sure I had it set to pure direct and not set to like surround mode because I th thought that maybe the center channel was was actually playing. And I think a lot of that has to do with the track tricks horn and its ability to control the treble directivity really well so it's not just spreading sound all throughout the room and smearing the soundstage. And now going down from the treble region into the mid-range and mid-bass regions things do get a little bit softer in their presentation a little bit wider. And now it's not so bad that it's distracting to where it sounds like the sound is coming from two different locations or 
instruments sound unnaturally placed because of how the scale of that instrument might play between the tweeter and the mid-range like acoustic guitars. Acoustic guitars still sounded very well placed. Um, they sounded appropriate in their scale, which was another thing that I found very pleasing. Listening to vocalists, if you're listening more of a sing-songwriter type of a, of a song, or even like Johnny Cash's Hurt, his voice sounded um, very appropriate in size and in placement. Um, he wasn't a little overly forward of the speaker, but he wasn't too far laid back. He was just right in line with the, the placement of the speaker, with the, the guitars flanking far left and far right, filling the rest of the room with sound. Now, as far as soundstage, soundstage depth um, took a little bit of work to get it sounding right for me. Uh, tonally, I like these speakers best when they were about two feet away from the wall. It gave just a hint of boundary reinforcement for the lower frequencies, without adding too much boom in the mid bass region, um, but the sound stage was fairly flat sounding. It wasn't until I got these speakers well into the room, I'm talking the tune of six feet away from the back wall, that sound stage really started to take shape and, and really started to grow in its depth. Now the sound stage width, I was never able to get really dialed in to where I can get the sound stage to extend much past uh, the boundaries of the speakers. One of my favorite tracks to listen to for that is Tool's Chocolate Chip Trip. There's a panning synthesizer effect that runs throughout the whole song, and some speakers just absolutely do a phenomenal job of making that sound like it's six feet to your left or right of that speaker, or sometimes even wrap around you to your actual sides. Um, this speaker was very much right in forward, in forward of you, and never really reaching far out to the sides. So that soundstage presentation being a little bit more forward of you with some depth, but not a whole lot of width, reminds me more of a, of a live sound presentation. So if you're a type of person that likes to listen a lot more live albums than studio albums, I think these speakers would actually be a pretty good fit for you. Okay, now that we've talked about the soundstage imaging, let's take a look at some measurements. Okay, let's take a look at some measurements for the R41M. Now what we are taking a look at here is an on-axis response um, using a combination of a ground plane measurement and a quasi-anechoic um, gated response. And there are some things to talk about in this response. First, let's talk about some of the claims on the speaker. On Clips' website, they are claiming a frequency response of 68 hertz to 21 kilohertz was a plus or minus three decibel amplitude variation. Um, so what we can do to very easily show what that would look like is we'll overlay a box that represents a plus or minus three decibel um, amplitude variation over our average of 80 decibels. Uh, notably, we'll talk about here in the base region, 68 hertz at minus three decibels would be what you would expect to see. Um, in reality, we are getting around 76 hertz at minus three decibels. If we go down to what is called the F10, which is 10 decibels down from our average, we are closer to the claim of the 68 hertz. So this is where you have to be careful about marketing material. Now going up to the top end, you can see starting right around four kilohertz and on up, the speaker just simply rises and rises to going to plus 10 decibels over our average between 12 and 13 kilohertz. This is not an insignificant amount. The way human hearing works for every 10 decibels of increased amplitude, we perceive that as being twice as loud, which leads to so many people saying that this speaker is bright because, again, 10 decibels is not an insignificant amount. That is substantial uh, over the average. Okay, so let's move on to the horizontal response. And the way we measure this is taking the microphone on axis with the tweeter and then rotating the speaker on a turntable at 10 degree increments, either left or right, from the microphone. Um, and those increments are represented in black, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet, which is 60 degrees off axis. Um, and you can see, for the most part, things are very well behaved here. It's a nice gradual drop off, starting from the pivot point right around one kilohertz, where everything just kind of just gradually drops off. And that points well to the speaker being a good candidate for equalization. So if you find the treble response to be just a bit much, you can EQ that down and it won't really spoil the overall sound signature of the speaker because of the off access response is fairly well controlled in the treble region. 
Now moving on to the vertical response, in this case we flip the speaker on its side on the turntable and then rotate it to simulate the microphone rising above the speaker in this case. And again those are black, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet being 60 degrees above the tweeter. Everything here looks fairly normal for what you would see for a two-way type of a speaker. Um, you do have a a null that develops right at the crossover point there, centered around 1700 hertz. So this is fairly typical of what you would see in a two-way speaker design. Now flipping the speaker and rotating it the other direction in order to simulate the microphone going below the speaker. Again, we're looking at black, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Nothing really out of the ordinary here. Um, going below a speaker in a two-way design usually is your worst case scenario, so if you have the speaker elevated above you, mounted higher, say for like a height type of a channel, which I know the speaker is somewhat popular for, you just want to make sure you point it down so that way you get the best possible frequency response um, without any of the major nulls that develop once you start moving below the speaker tweeter level. All right, and the last thing we're gonna take a look at is the impedance response. Now again, marketing material for the speaker on the website is a little bit on the confusing side or misleading. Um, they claim a nominal impedance of eight ohms compatible. I don't know exactly what eight ohms compatible means, uh, but what I can tell you is that at around 280 hertz, this speaker dips as low as 3.2 ohms. Couple that with the tweeter circuit being up above 10 ohms, this could be problematic for inexpensive uh, equipment, which is the, probably the market that's going to be looking at this speaker at this price point. Um, so if you're planning to run this in a two channel off, say like an inexpensive class D amplifier with Bluetooth, you could affect the way that the, that amplifier performs, particularly its frequency response. A lot of inexpensive class D amplifiers don't like unbalanced loads like this. And the same could be said for um, inexpensive receivers. Dipping down to 3.2 ohms when driven hard could cause issues with the amplifier um, running out of juice as far as trying to produce enough current in order to meet the demands of the speaker at such a low impedance. All right, now let's move on to my final thoughts. Hey, Grandpa, move your wrinkly old keister. Final thoughts. Clips has a sound, and it is a sound that has worked well for them for many decades. The, I think the main reason why so many people really gravitate to Eclipse speaker as like one of the very first hi-fi or two-channel type of a speaker is because, you know, most people, when they're listening to music, the vast majority of us are listening to our music while we're in our car. And quite frankly, car stereos are not very good. They've gotten better over the years, and some include DSP in order to really present really nice sound in them, but usually you're looking at the more luxury brands. If you're looking at the more run-of-the-mill, you know, mid-priced sedans, minivans, and trucks, those radios don't sound that great. So when you go into a big box store or get these in for the first time from online ordering, you hook them up and you play them, you're thinking, wow, there's all that detail and energy I've been missing. The problem is, it's just too much of a good thing for me. Another person that might like clips is somebody that actually has some hearing loss and upper treble frequencies. You know, maybe you're an older listener that you can't hear much above 13 kilohertz. I've been very fortunate that I've been able to maintain my hearing up to about 17 kilohertz. So with the speaker being up 10 decibels at 13 kilohertz, it's just simply a no-go for me. Now I know these are very popular in home theater packages that you can get from like Costco or Amazon. And I think they do okay as a surround. I personally did not test them out in my home theater this time. Um, I think they would do very well actually as a height channel or Atmos channel when mounted on a front or rear wall. And I think they'll do okay as long as you get the crossover correct because if you're placing this on like a wall mount type of situation, you're definitely gonna need to cut out some of that base so that way you um, don't get too much boominess from the speaker. So my suggestion to you is wait for these to go on sale. They usually go on sale for $90, sometimes about $120. At that price, buy it, give it a try. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, send it back. And with that, I'm Matt. This is the Ohm Audio channel. If you like the video, please hit the like button. Please consider subscribing if you like the content that I've been bringing you. 
um, and click on the bell notification icon to be notified when new videos are released. Check down below in the description box for other products I've reviewed, as well as the Amazon HD playlist that I use in order to evaluate all the speakers. And until next time, guys, be good to your ears.